Hello and welcome to another informative Connectionology webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your host, as always, Executive, Executive Director, Director of Connectionology, Connectionology Ginger, Ginger Jerk. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining us. I don't know about you, but I am extremely excited about today's webinar. We are going to learn so much from Lars, and he's even going to be talking about several cases that he's worked on. Um, so I can't wait to see what he's going to say. Um, but I do want to let you know you're probably going to have a lot of questions. And if you do, please make sure that you write them in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. And I'll try to ask some throughout the webinar, but mostly we're going to save them for the end. And then also midway into the webinar, you're going to meet our four incredible partners with HMR, Fast Funds, On Point, and Strategic. And I'm very excited for you to meet them as well. Um, but we want to get straight to it because there's a lot to cover. So I'm going to jump right in and introduce you to our incredible moderator. His name is John Romano, for those who do not know him yet. But he's a nationally renowned trial lawyer with Romano Law Group, which is a nationwide practice in West Palm Beach. And he's also a fellow of the International Academy of Trial Lawyers. He has served as a past president of the Florida Justice Association, the Melvin Belli Society, the Southern Trial Lawyers Association, and also the National Trial Lawyers. Um, he's authored three books, including The Discovery and Advocacy, which he was the editor and co-author of AAJ's Anatomy of a Personal Injury Lawsuit. If you've not read it yet, definitely go check it out. And he's also been inducted into Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame, which is, to me, it's such an honor. Um, but the biggest honor of all is being married to his beautiful wife, Nancy, for over 50 years. They have four children, two of them who actually practice with John. Um, their names are Eric and Todd. And then they also have 11 beautiful grandchildren. So, John, we are thrilled to have you today, and I cannot wait to hear what Lars has in store. Uh, thank you, Ginger. And uh, again, I, I thank you uh, all the time for this, but you are amazing executive director for uh, Connectionology Seminars. Our seminar director and Ginger is the one who makes all the webinars, the seminars, and we call it Connectionology because it is about all of us connecting with one another and networking to do more and better things for our clients and therefore our firms and thus our families. So I am very excited. We have a really extraordinary treat for you today. We're going to be hearing from someone who I call a, a thinker, a scientist, who knows how to talk to us in very practical and everyday terms. Our speaker today is Lars Daniel. And when I first met him and we spoke, it actually was at one of the seminar meetings and I learned more about him, more about his company. And what fascinated me was we have had so many cases in our practice where if we could just get the cell phones or the computers from a witness, from a defendant, from the bar, from the hotel, from the truck driver, in order to have it autopsied or deciphered by somebody who really knows what he or she is doing, it would take us miles and miles and miles ahead of where we are and where we need to be in terms of righting the wrong. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lars, who uh, is with Computer Forensics Investigation up in Raleigh, North Carolina. He is the co-author of the book, Digital Forensics for Legal Professionals, Understanding Digital Evidence from the Warrant of the Courtroom. He's also a co-author of the book, Digital Forensic Trial Graphics, Educating the Jury Through Effective Use of Visuals, which was published back in 2017. Now listen to this. He is an NK certified examiner, a Celebrite certified operator, CCO, a Celebrite certified physical analyst, CCPA, a certified work specialist, CTNS, certified wireless analyst, CWA, certified internet protocol telecommunications specialist, CIPTS, and a certified telecommunications analyst, CTA. If you think about the largest digital forensics seminar educational program um, really on planet Earth, he was one of their featured speakers a, a while back. 
because they look to him for the kind of information, the strategies he can bring to them. He is qualified as an expert in state and federal court throughout America in areas including uh, computer forensics, cell phone forensics, um, video forensics expert, photography or photo forensics expert, and much more. He is a, a brainiac who knows how to talk to us in practical terms. So I want to get on with it and then you're so grateful to have him with us and uh, be writing things down or sending in your questions because we're going to have someone who can provide you with the answers. So an honor and a privilege for Connectionology to present to you, Lars Daniel. Lars, the floor is yours. Take it away. Well, thank you so much. Let me share my screen here and we will get started. Appreciate that introduction. One moment. The joy of technology is expecting it not to work as you intend it to. And then when it does, you're readily surprised and happy. Uh... It's okay, Lars, At, while you're popping that up, um, I did want to let everybody know that this is our 99th webinar that we've done since April of last year. Tomorrow is our 100th webinar. I really hope that you can join us. Um, if you go to connectionology.com, that's where I'm adding all of our new webinars. And there are so many new ones, even for June. So thank you for signing up. Thank you for telling all of your colleagues and um, we appreciate your support. Um, so Lars, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Perfect. All right, we're going to hop right in. Once again, thank you for that introduction. Uh, as independent experts, we handle cases for both plaintiff and defense. I've done a lot of criminal cases as well, testify for both the defense and prosecution there as well. So the case example you're gonna see are coming from all over the place today. Now, these are not all plaintiff based case examples, but there's a lot to learn and it is uh, interesting to see it from all sides. Uh, so let's start there right now. Uh, in this case, we're gonna look at first, and I like to start with this one because it's holistic and looking at multiple types of evidence including call detail records, driver logs, and the actual data from the cell phone itself. Now, I was retained by the defense in this case. The plaintiff expert, the opposing expert, made two claims. One was that the driver's fatigue was one of the causes of the accident and that the driver was distracted at the time because they were using their phone. Well, the first claim there we will deal with is the distraction based upon using the phone. Uh, this expert said that iHeartRadio was at, was on at the time and that he was utilizing that application to play music and that the switching from one album to another meant that that person had the phone in their hand and select a different song. Now, if you're familiar with iHeartRadio or any application that plays music just about, when it goes from one song to the next and like your playlist, the album cover updates automatically. We were able to prove that this was an automatic function of the application and there was no use or no evidence of use of the phone in someone's hand or any other way being distracted in that fashion. They then do, uh, that is where then did what is called a lifestyle analysis. And what they do there is that they take the driver's logs, they correlate that information with the call detail records and the phone records, they smash that together and then you can see when they're driving and when they're texting and the voice calls and so forth. And these are sections from that opposing experts report. So you have that information there. They put this together and then you get this sleep analysis, okay? So you see on this first date, uh, you have two hours and 23 minutes, an hour and a half, an hour, 16 minutes are the times that this person could have slept according to this expert. So that is a weird phasal sleeping system. Obviously that does not look sufficient for a truck driver. I think we would all agree on that, especially with some of these other days. Uh, sleeping in that fashion would not be good. However, when he did his calculation, he included both incoming and outgoing activity from the phone and the call detail records. If you remove that information, what you were left with is a normal sleep schedule. And here's how this works. You have your phone, you go to bed, you wake up in the morning, you have five or six text messages and emergency email and whatever else. You are not awake for that. That's incoming activity. You cannot include that as activity that would keep someone awake. Only outgoing activity can be utilized for that or other evidence that shows a usage, user attribution, a person doing something with a cell phone. So that incoming activity, if you take that out, normal sleep schedule, a good outcome for the client. 
Now we're going to talk some technology here. We need to understand a little bit about cell phones, how the data is acquired, how it's copied out of those phones and utilized forensically, uh, and the methods that needs to be done and how it can be challenged, which we'll also talk about here shortly. Uh, but the first thing we need to talk about is just how unique cell phones are compared to computers or other devices. With most computers and other things like that, I can force it to give me all of its data. Cell phones are a little more difficult. Uh, they're very, very um, extensive research goes into the reverse engineering and hacking of these phones more or less by the primary tool providers. Uh, the primary is Cellbrite. If you've heard of anything, you will have heard of that one. We'll see a lot of screenshots of evidence from that piece of software as we move forward. Uh, but that's used by all your alphabet soup agencies, the FBI, CIA, NSA, private labs who can afford it, and the rest. It's an excellent tool. And there's other tools as well that uh, companies utilize to get that information. But at the end of the day, we all remember when you had to go to like a, a special store and spin the kiosk to find the that one charger that fit your particular model of phone, that's not the case anymore, right? That battle's pretty much done. It's basically Android and Apple. That's, that's the two that we have. So it's less unique in that sense. However, every time there's an update uh, to the operating system that there's a new phone that comes out, it does require in many instances, the ability and the need to go reverse engineer that, figure out how to get access to the data and so forth. Now, there are unique preservation issues related to cell phones, too. Uh, if you have a phone and it can receive or send data, that's a no-no. What you need to do is one weapon. If you're a forensic examiner, this is what you would do. You would put it in a Faraday bag. This is a radio frequency shielded bag that makes it so the phone cannot communicate at all. It cannot send any type of communication to the cellular network, a wireless network, or any other way. It works on the same technology as your microwave. So you put your food in the microwave and you microwave your lunch instead of your head, right? It contains all that inside a Faraday cage, more or less. The other issue and the other reason you need to do this is that uh, you can remotely wipe a phone. Uh, I've had a case, a criminal case I worked on where law enforcement took a phone into custody uh, and it was remotely wiped on the ride back uh, to the station, okay? So we've seen that multiple times in many different types of cases from civil to criminal and the rest. So that's not good. The other thing too, even if that didn't happen, if you have a pay-as-you-go phone, a, a kind of your flip phone, older stuff like that, or if you have these uh, uh, burner phones, right? Let's just call them that for lack of a better term. As new data comes in, it will delete older data to make room for that new data for your less sophisticated phones. Now, if the oldest data is what mattered in your case, that's permanently gone potentially depending on that phone. Uh, so we don't wanna do that. We wanna preserve the phone as a perfect snapshot in time of exactly what exists on it when we make our forensic copy, okay? Or when we collect that evidence. Now, what should happen? When you go on scene and you see that phone, what should happen? And I have language I can send you in protocols, all this for free, we'll send that out. But that phone should be collected and powered off. That's perfectly acceptable uh, if you don't have a concern about the passcode lock or the passcode is known. So if you either know it or if it's one that is supported, uh, there's thousands of models of phones we can crack the password in a matter of seconds. Um, and for other phones, yes, including iPhones, we have connections that allow us to crack those passwords as well. Uh, there's one rare instance, this is almost always law enforcement only where you'll see this, they take a phone out of a suspect's hand. Uh, it's unlocked at the time. They'll wiggle the finger back and forth on it to keep it awake till they can hook it to a forensic software to pull the data. Uh, that's a very rare, just letting you know that does exist on occasion. But what happens too often, right? What's the reality of the situation? Well, the first responder, whoever that is, does what I call is thumb forensics, right? So they're thumbing through that with no documentation, no training, and really no clue what they're doing. And the issue is when you are thumbing through a phone, Later on, when a forensic examiner gets to it, there's a chance we're not going to be able to tell or we're going to see that something is created or deleted or has been manipulated. And in report language, that would be intentionally or unintentionally through ineptitude, right? Uh, you can change data simply by touching electronic evidence. It's very fragile. It's very volatile. Uh, it's, it's prone to corruption if it's not dealt with correctly. Uh, and that's why advanced technology and tools, that's not IT tools, need to be utilized to collect this information. So we're gonna talk about that now. There's three types of primary acquisitions. When I say acquisition, we're talking about the data collection from a phone, how we get the data off of it. 
So if you see a Cellbrite or a forensic report, and make sure we understand everything we're talking about right now is coming from a physical phone we would get, okay? If we do something else, we'll look at some call detail records and some backups and things like that later. I'll explain where they come from. But for right now, the physical phone, we're pulling data from it. So you see these cool little things in the bottom left here. Those are some neat little tools. Those are pictures of Cellbrite right there. Get my laser pointer up right here. But logical files and logical acquisition is one form of acquisition you would get uh, when you're trying to collect that data from a phone. A logical acquisition gets what's called logical data. This is data that exists on a device uh, that you can see and access. Most of it is a normal user. There's other files in there that you can't, but they exist still, okay? Now, it can get deleted data without being able to get to deleted space. I use the term deleted loosely. Uh, it's how the industry uses it. I don't agree with it technically, but we're going to, uh, for the sake of expediency here, the way your phone works is that all these applications, whether it's your messages or whatever else, they're built inside of databases on the phone, okay? So if you imagine this database at the very beginning, it keeps track of where all the files live, and all those messages or whatever else, but the messages live in the storage space for the rest of the database. When that message is deleted, quote unquote, what it does is it marks where it lives and says, when I need more room, I can use that space to put another message. It hasn't deleted it. So forensically, we reconnect the database entry back to where it lives and can recover it. We can recover tremendous amounts of data from phones. It's best just to assume that you cannot delete anything from your cell phone unless you factory reset it or smash it with a hammer a lot, okay? Uh, so that's usually the safest bet with your phones. Uh, that's a logical acquisition. Now you also have what's called a file system acquisition. This gets logical files and also what are known as deleted files. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go extensively into this. I can send you articles on that too, but you get more raw material. You get more information that's gonna show you uh, information related to uh, the usage of the system on the phone, uh, activity, more location data, things like that. And we'll look at that artifacts, uh, those forensic artifacts here shortly. And then finally, we have the physical acquisition. Now this gets everything. This gets all that logical still existing data. It gets deleted files, which are kind of like half deleted data that we can recover. And then it gets what's called unallocated space, okay? Unallocated space is space that can hold a whole lot of data that can, we can recover, but it's not allocated to anything, okay? So it is not set to a, a program or whatever else that needs to store data here that connects back to a database. This is data that's just residing in a, in, a, in a spot on the phone that's not being used for anything, okay? So once again, this is the way your computers work and your phone works and a lot of electronics work. Uh, you delete a bunch of files, you know, you drop them in the trash can, you delete stuff on your computer or your phone. The database entry associated with it's also deleted, okay? So now we can't connect it back like we talked about a moment ago. So how do we get that data? This is where you use search terms and what's called carving, forensic carving to go in and find things like file headers and footers, basically like the first page and the last page of a book. You know, it tells you where everything's gonna live inside of it. And then you can use that to rebuild and carve out deleted data. So that can include everything from emails to messages, audio files, videos, anything you can imagine can be recovered from deleted space on a phone. Uh, that also brings up a point, how do you actually get rid of everything? The only way to really delete data is to overwrite data with more data. That's true deletion. So if you hear about like a DOD wipe or whatever, when you're trying to really get rid of all the data on a hard drive, for example, what you do is you connect it to a specialized piece of software that overwrites every single section of that hard drive with new data, random characters. That will get rid of all the data, but that's the only way. There's also chip off and JTAG. Uh, these are advanced methodologies for recovering uh, uh, data from a device. Obviously, this is a very burn up phone. This was actually from a truck accident here, and you can see it's heavily damaged. Uh, but in these methods, you were able to uh, either remove the chip, as you see here, aka chip off, and we can collect the data just like we have the phone, like that, or JTAG, which is joint task action group with a whole other bunch of methodologies to get the data and cool stuff too that I'm not gonna go into, but it's basically for heavily damaged devices like this, one or two, if it's an Android device that is password protected and the technology does not currently allow you to uh, get the data from that Android phone through the phone itself, like you just connect to it normally and get it, that doesn't mean you can't get it. We can still crack the phone open, pull the chip off and get the data that way in many of those Android phones too. All right, so when we're thinking about getting the data from a phone, 
it's important to know that there are tools out there. And I, I talk about this for one primary reason. When you're dealing with an engineer or a doctor or whatever else, they're going to have minimum qualifications that you can look at that even that they have to have to even practice, right? In my world of digital forensics, anyone can hang a, a shingle on their door and say they do what we do. The biggest hurdles to getting into this business are, are cost. The tools are very expensive. And then the training uh, is extensive to actually do it correctly. Now, using the tools like a Cellbrite tool or something to collect the data for about 80% of the phones is not terribly difficult. Uh, it requires a, a medium level of expertise. You can train someone to do it. But analysis, understanding what all that data you collect off the phone, the millions of types of artifacts that could potentially be recovered at this point with all the applications out there, that's complicated. That's where the real expertise comes in. Uh, and I'll show you a few examples of that here. Now, as an examiner, I can see this right here. This is a deleted picture. I see that JFIF in the top left. It's called a file header. I go down, find the file footer, and then I would parse this out correctly using the correct language. And it covers, and you see inside of forensic software here, we've recovered this picture, okay? That we rebuilt from that data that you just saw. I'll give you another case example. This is a doctor who was accused of talking to an underage girl. And... In this case, we had the girl's iMac, her, her desktop, her laptop, her phone, her iPad, and her iPod Touch. She had like everything Apple, and she's switching between all these devices, talking to this doctor, okay? And they're talking and talking, and in this information, there's gaps in the communication. It didn't make sense. They're using Messenger and some applications to do it. Uh, this is the first, of my knowledge, one of my examiners was able to go in and found and rebuilt by hand the database inside of Words with Friends and recovered the communication they had inside that game. Words with Friends is like Scrabble. You can play with people anywhere, but it has chat functionality. So in recovering that chat functionality, we we're able to have the full series of events uh, to get the complete story uh, to provide a good outcome for our client in that case so they get up all the information they needed uh, to understand the scenario in the context. Now, there's another form of getting data off the phones. And as a examiner, this is our last resort. It's the last thing we wanna do. We do this if forensics are not possible, but this is gonna be the most likely way you are going to collect a piece of evidence from a phone, like a screenshot type idea or a picture of messages, or it's one that's gonna be provided to you. Now we're gonna talk about some difficulties with this later. Uh, forensically speaking, I know there's ways uh, to, to authenticate this that are outside of the forensic realm, but forensically, we're going to talk about that and some challenges to that. But that's a manual examination. So it's exactly as it sounds. It's a manual process. The way this works is that you have a camera and you have a video camera. And the entire time that you are going through that phone, you're going through the messages and taking pictures of the messages, you're taking pictures of the emails or whatever is relevant on that phone. You are taking it with a separate camera. You are not screenshotting anything on that phone. If you screenshot on the phone, like you press your home and lock button on your iPhone, what you're doing is you're creating data on the phone, which is potentially deleting other data because it's using some of that unallocated space. It's allocating it to that picture. So you could be losing potential data there. And also you can create some timeline issues and other things because those are time stamped and saved on the phone. We don't want that. What we want to do is take pictures with a separate camera of the phone while we manipulate it and go through the messages. Now, here's the critical point. All the other ways we just talked about with those acquisitions, logical, physical file system, I have a mathematical hash algorithm and cyclical redundancy checks and all these other things that happen when we collect that data. And what that ensures is that it's tamper-proof. It's spoilation-proof. We have the ability to say this is exactly as that data existed as a perfect snapshot in time. That's our verification to take to court. If we're doing a manual examination, we have no hash algorithm. So what do we have to have? How do we verify that we did this correct? We didn't screw anything up. We didn't change anything. To do this, you have to have a video camera recording the entire process from the time you take it out of secure storage, you're your custody, you, you uh, power it on, you take all your pictures, you power it off and put it away. You need a video for all of that, okay? That's your verification. That's what you can provide as the evidence that you did not modify, delete, or change anything intentionally or unintentionally. Got to have that video. Now, if you've seen a manual examination, the chances of having that are very low. And we're going to talk about uh, actually having a video. It, it, for some reason, 
many examiners still run around not making these videos. And I'm going to show you how to challenge that later with their own documentation, including from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, who set the rules for many examiners, including government agencies. If NIST does not uh, approve a tool or a methodology, and many times, uh, like the FBI can't use it until they do, okay? So they're, they're really important in our world. Okay, we're gonna look at some forensic artifacts now. Then we're gonna hit some case examples, and we're gonna come back to what I said about challenging the evidence and looking at those issues too with manual examination. So we're gonna come back to that. But right now, let's actually look at some of the information that can be recovered from the phone itself. Now, this is cell bright screenshots that we're looking at. So if you see right here, that's what we're gonna be going through right now. So your phone, sees wireless networks, you know this. You go around with your phone and it says, hey, can, would you like to join this network? Well, regardless of whether or not you say yes, there's a potential depending on your phone and the version of the operating system uh, that it is recording that it saw that wireless network. Now the average broadcast range of the wireless network like in your home or anywhere else is about 150 feet. So what do we have? We have geolocation information of 150 foot radius of about where you were, okay? That's very good location data. Uh, we see that here with this uh, excellently named Bill Y, the Science Fi. That's a great name for a wireless network. I'm a big fan. But we'd have geolocation with this. That's been blurred out down here. We can even see the application you were utilizing when you did that, okay? So you see Google and YouTube and so forth here. Now, here's an example from a criminal case we worked on showing this. So if we go up this street, here are the defendants in this one, and they go up this street, and as they are riding up, the phone sees every wireless network in this neighborhood until they get to the crime scene. They do the crime, allegedly. And then you see them drive back out and you see the wireless network on the phone sees all of those too. So what does this mean? You have that many location points. Each one of those pins has a date and a timestamp and a geolocation with a 150 foot radius. That is, that is excellent excellent location data right here. Trying to say you're not in that area will be incredibly problematic, or at least the phone's not, right? I can't say uh, who's got the phone in their hand. That's your job as an attorney. My job is to say where the phone's at, but we can do that with this. All right. We also obviously can recover Google map data. There's geolocation data and we can see what you search for. So you see that under name and here's some more. Your phone is collecting location data from many sources, including cell tower data that it sees from the cellular network. It's seeing it from harvested data, which I'm not gonna get into too much here. It sees wireless networks like we just mentioned, and it also has GPS coordinates, okay? Your phone, modern smartphones have a GPS chip in them. That's why they are almost better in almost every instance for, for navigating than your old Garmin's and TomTom's did, right? Because it can utilize GPS, Wi-Fi, cell towers, all of that to get location information. Uh, so that they can see where you're at and, and track that and it stores it in the phone, uh, depending on the application and, and the operating system and the model and the rest like that. I have to say that a lot. It, there's a lot of caveats in digital forensics. Here's some other examples of location data. So this is directly from Cellbrite. We can actually pull it up and I can show you on a map. I have another class where we actually go through the actual forensic report live and we can see all the data, manipulate it and do cool stuff. But if you see right here, we have uh, all these different locations. We have about 10,317 recovered, deleted, coming from Apple Maps, your calendar, Find My iPhone, Google Maps, your messages. Somebody can send you a location and a message. You can report your location or share that in your messages. iOS locations, uh, I will show you in a little bit uh, some, some interesting things on how you can see where your phone's tracking you too. I'll send you that when we get done on this call. Uh, we have your mail can, can provide location data, Uber, we can see where your Ubers were at, where you called them, where you went, and ways and more. Hey, hey Lars, um, sorry, I saw a couple of really great questions come in um, sure. that I actually want to know the answer to. Um, what effect does having the location services function turned off? If you turn location services off, yeah, so if you turn location services off, it will not record much of what we're doing right now. It will not record a lot of this location like you see from the phone. However, you can't not be tracked by your phone because that information is still going to be recorded in the call detail records that you can subpoena and get that information. The cell tower records like that, that historical records will be there. The issue is this, though. Everything in technology, in your phones especially, you're on the spectrum, and on one side, is security and the other is convenience, okay? And the more you go towards security, like 
the less stuff your phone can do, the less fun it is. It can't recommend you restaurants. It can't tell you if that place is busy. It can't tell you when you need to leave so you can get a coffee before you get to work. It can't tell you any of that, right? So what do people tend to do? They tend to make these devices more convenient, more useful, more fun, more of an assistant to you, right? Uh, and in doing so, when you do that, it has to record a lot of information about you, a whole lot, so that I can guess what you're going to do and what you want. This is extremely interesting. <laughs> I know everybody's enjoying this. Um, we were having a lot of great questions come in. I do want to ask one more. Um, sure. Steve Person, amazing attorney out of Michigan, if you guys don't know him yet. Um, he says, Lars, have you had any luck with third party apps, particularly Waze? Uh, Waze reco recovering data, yes. So if we even lock in this one, we have 178 trips down here at Waze at the bottom that will recover from this phone. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Yep. All right. I'll let you, let you get back to it, and then we'll be introducing two of our wonderful partners in just a few minutes. Great. I'll go about five more minutes and we can do that. So we can also recover user accounts. So if you look right here, uh, if you've ever had someone in a case and they say, I've got one email account, right? And like, I'm not sure if I believe that. Maybe you got another phone or something, but that doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. I remember back a long time ago doing a family law case where a gentleman had 50 email accounts he actively utilized for all of his... Uh, activities. But as we see right here, uh, this person will say, I only got one Yahoo account, but you get on the phone, you recover this stuff and you have multiple accounts that you're utilizing to communicate. And we recover that and the passwords as you see here. So it can generate a lot of leads, other places to subpoena other data to go after uh, hidden data that they have. There's so many ways to obfuscate data now, especially with cloud based storage and the rest. But at the same time, it produces a lot of artifacts if you look at it forensically that you can recover to find that information and utilize it later. And also searches, right? We all love searches. Uh, people utilize their phones today to consume and create more information than they do computers. Think about it. You're out somewhere, you want to look something up, you pull out your phone, you search on your phone, right? You use your phone all the time for this because it's like always in your pocket. We always have it. And searches are more than just uh, your Chromes, your Safaris, your, your, your web browsers, right? We see that in the bottom. We have Google Chrome, what we'll search for here. And then we have also on the left, we have the Play Store. And this is actually from a real case where it was spoofing calls. Fake text, prank, pranks on your phone, voice changer. They're looking for applications to download for this. And if you look in the top right, that's YouTube, right? And YouTube is the uh, video repository of all human knowledge. I've, I've seen, uh, I know how to make poison from potatoes and cigarettes and all kinds of stuff from that, from cases, not from personal interest. Uh, I, we worked on a case uh, where a gentleman beheaded his girlfriend and he, he searched before doing that, how to behead my girlfriend on YouTube. I had another one of someone was accused of embezzling millions of dollars from a company and they, they YouTube how long will I go to jail for embezzling X amount of dollars? They didn't know the dollar amount yet, but it was exactly what they, what they were accused of later. So uh, lots of great stuff in searches. And the number of searches we recover, is just, it's ridiculous, to be honest. Uh, I'll show you one example from the transportation case on this. This was a young lady, a very sad case. She's 16, riding down the road, um, hits an 18-wheeler. We examine her phone. What we're able to see is that at the point of impact, she is searching for an obituary for a friend who passed away. So she's hitting the search button when the impact happens, according to eyewitnesses. Uh, so you can see that directly on the phone. It's really hard to not see what's happening if the phone's being utilized, especially if it's preserved in a timely manner. Uh, even if it's not, a lot of times we can still get that data back, but the sooner you preserve it, the better. Uh, I have language for that and everything, once again, that we can send you. Internet history. Tremendous amount of records in internet history. One thing you need to know is that it's very hard to get rid of internet history. It's almost never gone. Private browsing is not really private. We get all that back or porn mode, whatever you want to call it. Your private browsing is not gone typically. Uh, we can recover that significant amount of data from that and understand that even a short internet session, you go on, you're clicking around for two, three minutes can create dozens or hundreds of records because it's redirecting and it's pulling down data and doing all this stuff. And it's all time stamped uh, very granularly with a whole lot of information. Uh, we'll do one more case example, then I'll take a pause here. And this is an example of this. So using internet history, uh, this was a truck driver uh, riding down the road and he has got the phone in his hand. He's on Facebook. 
He clicks a link inside of Facebook that kicks him out to a web browser. And we can see all this on the phone in timeline order. He kicks it out to a web browser. And as he's playing a game, one of these quiz games, it's, it's like, what nationality should I really be based upon my favorite pizza toppings? He answers the question and we can see answers question one, answers question two, answers question three. Then he hits finally to hit his get his results to see what his nationality should be on his favorite pizza toppings. And he plows through an intersection, causing a lot of bodily injury and hurts a lot of people. Uh, this actually was, was uh, went criminal after the civil case. All right, I think that's a good spot, good, good spot to pause here. Okay, great. Sorry, I was just like smiling because I'm. <laughs> there's so many amazing questions that are coming in. Um, and while I'm bringing in two of our wonderful partners, I'm going to ask a couple in the meantime. Um, so Lars, does Invista have a standard format for letters of preservation with respect to cell phone or digital communication correspondence? Yeah, I have a packet we can send for, uh, it's got cell phones, call detail records, video evidence, it's got all of it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That This message was from Terrence Lockman. So Terrence, I will email you Lars's information in just a minute. And then what about does, this one comes from John Roberts, great question. Does the flip phone keep as much geo data as you described for the smartphone? Your flip phones, uh, no. They can, depending on the applications on the phone, uh, and it always is, the answer is always it depends, right? That's the problem. But mm -hmm. the thing is, too, is that a lot of your, your kind of throwaway phones at this point are like basic smartphones, so they will be recording that data. It, it's pretty unlikely to see a true, true burner phone anymore. Uh, but once again, you can still get that location data from call detail records and other locations, too, even if it's not on the phone. But yes, it is less likely the less smart a phone is, the less data like we're going to see here. Okay, great. And um, let's see, while I'm waiting for everybody to come in, looks like to see Connor. How are you doing today, Connor? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for joining us. I know Kim will be here in just a minute. Um, and Lars, is it okay to close out just for a second? Don't forget your spot, though. Perfect. And um, I see Kim is joining us too, which is wonderful. Kim, um, please go first. Let us know a little bit about more what uh, On Point offers. I know that you guys do great work all over the country. And I know John Romano loves working with you guys as well. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what you do. Thanks, Ginger. First of all, this is fascinating. <laughs> I'm amazed and we're so thankful for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm just gonna pull up my little screens here. Can you all see that? Okay. <laughs> On point, um, we're a legal nurse consulting and expert witness firm, and we've been supporting attorneys for 25 years on any cases involving illness and injury. We have four programs that can help you. If you find that you're getting bogged down with complex cases, the nurses in our consulting program have a lot of experience helping attorneys and they can help make the complex information simple. They do this through detailed timelines and chronologies that include our unique case analysis, which outlines strengths and weaknesses, as well as identifies missing records, systems failures, red flags, and possible defense strategies. Our nursing home and long-term care program can assist with anything long-term care related from a simple thumbs up, thumbs down, merit screens to experts who are familiar with the standards of care. Our program coordinator is a clinical geriatric specialist and she has over 30 years in that industry. Our expert witness program provides experts in any specialty needed who are all clinically active and located nationwide. For damages, we excel in quantifying damages with our life care plans and our medical cost projections, which are a lower cost option for less complex cases. For non-economic damages, our pain and suffering analysis helps to tell the client's story. It quantifies what the client experiences, loss of freedom, loss of mobility, we pull that information out of the records for you to expand upon. For example, recently, our pain and suffering analysis along with chronology and case analysis were impactful in a $13 million settlement. Does this look familiar? Our goals are to make sure you are not blindsided, 
to simplify the medicine and to avoid surprises. Overall, helping you to maximize your case settlement value. We're accessible, easy to work with. Feel free to email me to discuss a case or you can submit information through our website as well. Thanks, Ginger. Fantastic. Thank you, Kim. And um, if you don't mind, definitely put your information in the chat box for everybody as well. Okay. And we will see you again, um, if not tomorrow, definitely next week. Okay. One second. One pause. I'm going to let Connor go first. I'm going to go grab the, the little much. Thanks, Ginger. Hey, so we are an open source research group. And, uh, and for the last almost 20 years now, uh, we've been operating outside of the discovery period. And uh, we specialize in identifying ex-employees of corporate defendants and then flipping them and turning them into insider witnesses or, uh, or whistleblowers. Um, and we do this in kind of a two-step process. And the first step is to create and source an actual list of names of ex-employees. Um, and it's a really unique product because it's specifically tailored to what would benefit you most. Um, so for example, if you only need um, cashiers and managers of Walmarts in Tennessee, that's where we're gonna find you. Uh, we're not gonna give you some giant list that you have to pick and piece through uh, that would benefit you. So once we get your actual list, then we can come in with our interviewing team and, uh, and we will call everybody that's on that list and really get them to become sympathetic towards your case and towards your clients. So I really cannot stress the importance of ex-employees enough. Uh, they are absolutely detrimental to your defendants um, because you know, they, they've seen the day-to-day -day operations. They have seen that negligence from within uh, and they're willing to talk about it. We work with lawyers all across the country that have utilized this in a number of different cases, ranging from nursing home cases to dram shop, slip and fall, it doesn't matter. Um, we've done uh, pretty much every type of case that there is. So I have redacted copies here of our EEL, our ex-employee list that I would love to share with anybody that's interested. Um, we also do work with finding class reps in class action lawsuits. And we also can run um, other similar incident reports which are extremely useful uh, as well. So if you're interested, my information will be in the, in the uh, chat below. Please feel free to call, text, or email me anytime. Thanks, Ginger. I'm so glad that you mentioned that too, Connor, because I actually know a couple attorneys who are working with you guys right now on some class action um, lawsuits, and it's incredible the amount of people that you guys are finding. Yeah. So I almost feel like you need to do some work with Lars because you can <laughs> find the people that nobody can find, and no one's even doing this type of work like you are so it's pretty incredible and then lars can do it finally evidence so yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyway this is a really interesting subject and a little scary at the same time so yeah i feel like i need to turn my, my phone off <laughs> but anyway um thank you so much for joining us definitely put your information in the chat because i get questions all the time about people wanting to reach out to you guys absolutely. so thanks for being with us today and um, i look forward to seeing you tomorrow on our 100th webinar too Wow. Awesome. Can't believe it. Thanks, Ginger. All right. Thanks so much, Connor. All right, Lars, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you. And um, we're going to keep going. And then a little bit later on in the webinar, um, we're going to introduce our final two partners. And then we will get to all the questions because I see a lot of good ones coming in. So thank you so much. All right. Let me get this shared again. One moment. All right, excellent. We did that one. Okay, so now we're gonna get call logs. Now call logs, obviously no surprise, we can recover call logs. There's something I really want you to see here though. Everywhere you see an X, that's a recovered deleted call log. Those are deleted calls, okay? Your phone will, if you have a smartphone, it will not selectively delete calls. A human deleted those calls, they're recovered here, okay? So see that we have multiple recovered deleted calls, see those X's. Get my pointer up so I can point. Also, look at the very bottom here. This call is zero 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 seconds. Like what? That what is that? Why is there a call that's zero seconds? And why do we care? We care for this reason. That puts that phone in someone's hand at a date and time. Okay. 
Where else will you get this information having this outgoing call right here? Nowhere. So what is this? This is like a, like a butt dial, right? You accidentally hit the dial and hit stop. That's what this is. But it is a call by a person, but it has not lasted long enough to connect to the sailor network. You have no record of this call anywhere but getting the phone itself, okay? So if it really matters in the timeline, that's where that's going to come from. A few examples related to calls too, we're going to jump over. This is the phone itself. Now I just want you to see from call detail records. So these are records that you would subpoena. Once again, that's in the packet. I'm happy to send you uh, with for each carrier and what you should get in response. Okay. Uh, so what we have here, in this case, the opposing expert did not adjust the time zone. So I'm not going to cover all the details because it take too long. But in this case, they're seven hours off, okay? Because these call detail records when you UTC time, which is zero, right? And then you have to calculate the offset, whether Eastern or whatever your time zone is, they were seven hours off. So all of their analysis was completely useless, okay? The details matter. The devil is in the details of digital forensics. It absolutely is. Uh, and a lot of times when you're dealing with these things, it doesn't make sense because it's done by a program or some nerd somewhere who does it for a reason that's not about trying to uses evidence, okay? So you have to analyze and be able to interpret that data. So seven hours off, useless examination by that expert, good outcome for our client. Here's another one too, okay? And this one, the opposing expert was saying, these are all these phone calls. Look at all these phone calls that this driver is making going down the road. That sounds nice, except for these are routing. Uh, these numbers means that this is an automated function of the cellular system. A person did not do those. You have to remove those. It actually says that in the records, uh, they utilize those to try to say all these calls were happening. We showed this and obviously uh, they came to their senses and realized there were no calls uh, related to those instances right there. All right, messages, huge, huge, hugely important, obviously text messages. We have a lot to see on this page. Let's start here. Everywhere you see an X is a deleted recovered message. We can recover a lot of messages, okay? That's the first thing. Second, where you see parties here, those are the names in the address book, your contact list. And this person had deleted their contacts, okay? But using forensic software, we're able to rebuild it. And then it puts the name back to the number that that person had associated with. Now, if you've ever had like 300 phone numbers, you got to find out who's who at the zoo and you got no you got to track back all those numbers. That's a massive pain and a huge time sink. This way, we know what that person named all those people. So he recovered, rebuilt it. That's why it's in red. All right. Now, if we go to the top right over here and we look at analyze data, you'll see iMessage communication, right? You see a whole lot of those. And then we see chat communication as well. So if we're looking at those, when you see um, MMS and SMS messages, the very bottom's SMS, we have 13,000 of those. That short message service messages, MMS is multimedia message service messages. Uh, carriers, if the carriers record this, will record the text message transmission being sent, or sent back or forth in a call detail record, okay? So MMS and SMS messages transmit on the sailor system in such a way that they will create a record of existing and having been sent in a call detail report, okay? iMessage communication does not. Snapchat does not. What at WhatsApp does not. Kick Messenger does not because these transmit via data, okay? So if this was your case and you just got the call detail records, you'd see that 13,000 messages went back and forth. You wouldn't have the content. You just have the, the transmission that they actually went back and forth. You'd have 28 thousand messages you don't know exist. Now, let me ask you this. You have kids, you have younger people that you know, how often do they use messaging? How often do they use Snapchat and WhatsApp and Signal and Kick Messenger and everything else? All the time, because you can do cool stuff with those that you can't do with SMS and MMS. If you want that, you probably need to get the phone, okay? One more thing. Look at the very bottom why I've circled unread down there, that very last message, okay? It's a deleted, recovered message. Remember how he talked about thumbing through the phone and how dangerous that can be? Let's pretend you had this phone and you thumb through it. Now that status on that message is unread. If someone thumbed through this phone before it was forensically acquired or collected, that message would go from unread to read because you clicked on it. So now you are attributing knowledge to the content of that message 
to the custodian when in reality there was no evidence they ever saw it, but you have changed that evidence by touching the phone uh, without it being forensically acquired first, okay? So that's one of the reasons why we don't want to do that. Now, obviously, uh, installed applications, that's useful a lot of times to see what people have put on the phones. Uh, a really quick example of this, we had someone who uh, was accused of putting a GoPro camera in a dressing room, said it wasn't me, I never did it, I never had a GoPro, I didn't do it. Uh, however, we did recover a deleted installation of a GoPro. Uh, and in this version of that GoPro, you had to use a phone to connect to it to see the footage. We were, at, we were able to link it directly to that installation, to that camera, okay? So very helpful to have that information there too with your installed applications. Pictures as well, okay? What I want you to see here primarily, you see in the metadata field, that very first picture, let me get my little laser pointer again. We see this was taken by an LG Electronics VM670 phone. We have the capture time. That's the time the picture was taken. I want you to understand this, pay attention. If you have a picture and it shows a created time, that is not the time the picture was taken. The created time is the time that that file began to exist on a file system of electronic device, okay? It has nothing to do with when the picture was taken. The picture time, when it was actually taken, is stored in the metadata. You've heard of metadata, it's data about data, like metacognition, thinking about thinking, right? Metadata is data about the data itself that's embedded in the file that you can access with special tools. With that, we can see a capture time. We can also see latitude and longitude coordinates where it geolocated the picture when it took it. That's almost all phones and cameras do that now, okay? But what about this? Look at the second picture down. We have a Samsung SPH M820 phone that took this picture, okay? We have no capture time and none of the additional metadata here. What can we say about this? I can tell you conclusively that this picture was not taken by this phone, that it was received from another phone or that it was got from the internet or whatever else. So if someone's trying to claim that whatever the contents of that picture was, uh, something happened to me, this, whatever, they sent me this thing. No, you got that from the internet, right? You didn't, that's not real. That's not how this works, right? We would have this other information if you took it with that phone, okay? Uh, we can see powering events. So if someone gets that phone, like a, the other side has the phone for a while and they're turning it on and off, and whatever else, we can see all that time with the timestamps of when they did it. And one of my favorite was, uh, we got all this recorded and then the opposing expert actually took a couple pictures of their big head by accident. I don't know what they were doing, but we had that in the all the powering on and off events. Uh, we also can see if you have connected to a Bluetooth device. So if you're using a headset or if you're talking through uh, the mouthpiece, if you are using Siri or you're typing with your hand, in many instances, we can determine uh, the method of, of utilizing the phone to search or communicate or whatever, right? Obviously, it's a big difference if they're talking with a headset versus utilizing the whole handset or speakerphone. And also, obviously, Siri to send a message versus typing on the phone are different levels of distraction. That's not my area of expertise. I would provide that information to you to give a human factors expert. I stay in my lane. Uh, but we can absolutely recover and see the Bluetooth devices as well. Now, application events. There's a whole lot of this here. If you connect a phone to a car, we can see when you connect it and it's gonna be recorded on the phone, okay? We see here this CarPlay splash screen, this dot .apple right here, com.apple. This is when you plug it in via USB or Bluetooth, it'll activate that and we can see when you plug it in. Pretty neat, huh? There's a lot more we can see too. Here's some more examples of this. You can see what they're doing with it while it's connected in. So we can see you transition to the home screen, right? Uh, that has gone idle, that you lifted the phone and it woke itself up. You gestured on the phone, you like scroll back and forth, zoom, pinch, all those types of things. You've gone back to the home screen and the rest. Now, let's look at it right here. This is within Cellbrite Forensic Software. I know this is kind of small, but here's what I want you to see. You can see when you change the orientation, you hold the phone up, you turn it sideways, you take steps, you go upstairs, that's all recorded in the phone. You unlock it, you, you route it from talking on your headset to going to your AirPods. It will show that you did that inside the system activity on the phone. So you have all that information 
very granular. You look at the times here when somebody's using this, 952, 1002, 953. I mean, you have very granular, very close time, and it records a huge amount of that data, including here that the phone was unlocked, right? We blew these out just so you could see it. Unlock the phone and you change the orientation landscape. So did they have the phone in their hand? Did they unlock it? Yeah. Did they turn it a direction? Yeah. Right. That's not going to happen by accident. Phones don't unlock themselves. That's user attribution. All right. There's nothing better than electronics for creating extensive timelines. Now I'm going to do a caveat here that I teach in one other class. So just do a short version here. It's very much my opinion that an expert should not be able to qualify as an expert in digital forensics and talk. It, let, me, let me start over. A fact witness should not be able to talk about times with electronic evidence. It's too complicated. It requires being an expert to talk about what the times mean because they're very complicated. There's many, many ways that these times can change or that they don't appear as you think they should. Uh, so it's very important for that. Uh, I have a whole section on, on where I dealt with an opposing expert and they were not allowed to testify as an expert because they could not show the necessary qualifications to talk about the time but that's for another class. But timelines are amazing. Now imagine this, you get a report from the opposing side from a cell phone, like a PDF, and they print it out and you have messages and emails and everything else all separate. Now you gotta like try to cut them all into like little strips of paper and put it back on a board to try to figure out what happened. That's a pain, right? And you can't filter, you can't search, you can't do anything. Uh, within forensic software, we can see it in order. We can filter it. We can search it and do all the rest. So we can see exactly what's happening in order. Let me show you a case example of that right now. Uh, this we were retained by the defense. Uh, this is the plaintiff's phone in this case. Okay. So what we're seeing right here, going down, using the phone, riding in the car. Okay. He's in the car. He's got an application open for his pharmacy. He's trying to take a picture of the pill bottle so he can upload it to free fill his prescription. He takes the first picture here, it's a little blurry. He takes the second picture here, it's a little blurry. He takes the third picture and it's perfectly crisp and clear. Uh, he also goes under the back of the 18 wheel and is decapitated at the same time, okay? So that right there, that picture, phone in the hand, taking a picture, uploading it to an application, right? So you can say all that on the phone in timeline order. All right. Now we're going to get to challenging some of this evidence uh, right now. We're going to begin with manual examinations, okay? And I'm going to tell you why I think this is important. Uh, remember what we talked about. When you're doing the manual examinations, this is where you're taking pictures of a phone, right? And you have a video recording you. Look, you can do that if you need to get something too, and it's really important. You don't need an expert if it's not a big enough case. Take that phone. You've got it in airplane mode, right? So it can't receive anything in or out. You record even with a separate iPhone, right? While you take pictures with another camera of that phone. You just need a video, the whole process, okay? But we got to isolate it from all the networks. You get a video verification and complete documentation. All right, that's my point in this. So uh, I'll, you'll have this PowerPoint so you can read all this later. I'm not going to read all this stuff from my affidavits and other work. But I'm going to say that taking screenshots or pictures constitutes a forensic manual examination, right? That's, the, that's the, what I call it, uh, and that you need certain things in order to do that. First, you got to isolate it from the networks. So how about then we, we put in some exhibits? Here's NIST saying this. You got to isolate it uh, right here. You can, you can pull that one. Uh, this is like the biggest organization out there for approving tools and the rest for the government, all that, law enforcement, you name it. Uh, then you have digital evidence of computer crime. Egan Casey, Benjamin Turnbull say the same thing right here. Got to isolate it. And then this is from our first book. Uh, we say the same thing in protecting cell phone evidence. Now, how do you know if it's not isolated? If you get a picture from the opposing side and you see bars like wireless bars or cellular bars, they didn't isolate it. Right? That's it. You know from that picture, okay? Uh, that's all you got to look on there. So that should that should not happen, okay? We see it a lot. It does happen, but it should not happen. So there's your exhibits to put in, and then also video verification, right? You got to have that full video to prove that you didn't change anything. Here's NIST saying that, here's Egan Casey, Benjamin Turnbull saying that, and here's from our book saying that as well, okay? Got to have video verification. Why does this matter? Why do we care? It's because fake messages are real. Fake content is a huge problem right now, and we're seeing more and more, co uh, more evidence of this in lots of cases. It's easy to make fake evidence in digital world. Digital world. It really is. I'm going to show you a few ways. It doesn't require uh, high-level techn technical sophistication at all. So let's look at some spoofs and fakes. 
using web-based applications. So you can go on the internet and do this right now, okay? So let's start with this. This is uh, some fake ones I made. First, we're starting here with uh, Facebook. So the date, time, location, content, comments, all that is fake. That's me having a conversation with myself, completely fake I made. This is a fake post with fake comments, with fake people saying stuff. It looks absolutely real, just like a real screenshot. Here is Instagram. Uh, here's a fake conversation I've made. Uh, here's a fake place that I've gone to with fake people liking it and fake pictures and the rest, right? I've made all this in, a, in, in, in an hour and I took my time to make it look nice, right? So it doesn't, it's not hard. Uh, we have Twitter as well. And Twitter, you know, is like the, the best place for, for good civil communication. But we have a private conversation that's fake. We have fake tweets that are fake. Here is uh, WhatsApp as well, fake conversations. All this right here, right? I can make this be any person I want it to be. The same with Snapchat. Here is a fake snap. Looks absolutely real. Looks just like a screenshot from a phone. If I screenshot one of these and send it to you, be the exact same look as this, okay? And iMessage. Here is a completely fake iMessage communication. So if you received a screenshot in Discovery and you're a little concerned about the authenticity of it, maybe it's not real. Maybe you need more information to authenticate that data because this can be made. Now, you don't even have to use these fancy applications. Let's do it with just the phone. So let's just, you could just take your phone out and do this right now, okay? Let me show you a few ways to do that. Well, I'm talking to Larry. Larry's my friend. I don't want to incriminate him or get him in trouble. So I just take, change the name in my contact list. Now, all that conversation is from David, right? And then I screenshot those and send that in, okay? So now it looks like it's a totally different person who did all this. You can still do this with your iPhone. This is nuts. I just did this recently just to re-verify that you can do this. You can set the time on your iPhone to anything you want, okay? So I could set this back to any date I can imagine. Turn off the automatic clock. Now, you turn it off. You have your email as one of your iMessage communications, and you can make a name. I did fake contact for our purposes here. That's my cell phone number. And I can have a communication with myself with one phone. And you see over here that final conversation that I have. You screenshot that, you send it in, you can make fake contact, be any person that you want it to be, okay? All right. One case example here, let's look at a real one, then we'll pause, okay? So this is an actual case example. In this case, it was a criminal case. Uh, we were retained by the criminal defense attorney. And this one, this client had been in jail for six months, okay? Six months by the time we were brought onto this case. He's been accused by the ex-girlfriend of threatening her. He's been arrested. He's sitting in jail for six months. Uh, if you're sensitive, there is language in this. Uh, I doubt there's anyone that's too problematic. Uh, your attorneys, you've, you've heard and seen it all. Uh, obviously, this is not my report. Uh, I do not write in all caps, and I know what punctuation is, but here you go. So this is the report that the law enforcement officer filled out. The victim has a 50B order on the defendant. Can't contact her via phone. Uh, he sent a text to her stating he was going to go to replace bodily injury with a gun and all that stuff, right? So what are the facts? 50B order twice in the past, stayed on text, he's aware of the police, to go after her, threatening your life, said, uh, you're really dumb, I'm not concerned about a restraining order, I don't have a care in the world about the law, I do what I want, uh, you can't call the police, you're in big trouble when I get off to work, you know, normal stuff, couples say to each other, the law didn't take my guns, all that stuff, right? Well, here's the evidence she submitted to law enforcement that they utilized, okay? Here's a text message conversation, you know, saying lots of uh, unpleasant things back and forth. Okay, do you see any numbers on this or names? I don't. I see where they wrote some stuff into the top right. That's that's not helpful to me. We have another one. This is allegedly after being served the restraining order, but we don't have any dates on this either. We have a time. We have a handwritten date in there. That's not terribly useful. But then she claims she starts using a new phone. This is what I needed. I got a phone number now, okay? I've got a phone number in this. And then what we do is we take that phone number, we use a see phone number below. What I mean by that is it tells us who owns it, like as in Verizon or whatever else, not a person. That's more work than that, okay? So you get that, you find out who owns it, you send a subpoena to get the subscriber information. What we find out is that this is related to uh, uh, GoTextMe, which is a uh, an application you utilize that gives you a phone number and you can communicate with it. But here's a few things that we see. One, the username, Jake the Snake. The sign up date, we have that. We have the email here, Jake the Snake K at tahu.com. Now, how many of you have a Tahu email account? None of you, right? Because it's not a real email address. And not verified as specified by user means that this was never authenticated. So you create a new account. 
Uh, it sends you an email. You got to put the code in or click the link to say it's real, right? To verify it. That didn't happen. It didn't happen by phone number either. Two really important things. IP when number is signed. IP addresses work a little differently for phones a lot of times than with computers and in, in, in some situations. It can point back to a particular device instead of a public IP. I'm not going to talk about that right now. That's for the computer friends this class. But what this means is that this goes back to a particular device. We've got an IP address. It's a sign that's unique to one person, okay? We also have a device ID. A device ID is related to the physical piece of hardware you hold in your hand. You can wipe that phone 100 times and the device ID is not going to change. It's unique to the physical phone, okay? All right. So we get the IP address. Then we find out who owns the IP address, so who is lookup. And then we subpoena them. And... It belongs to Verizon. That's the first thing we see. Okay, so this is before we subpoena it, and it's, it's Verizon. His phone's on Sprint. That's a little odd. So you send the subpoena in, you get that information, and she had the IP address at that time, and this device ID is her phone. She faked all of this. Uh, after this, uh, all the charges are dropped, and he was let out of jail, uh, but all completely fake, all completely spoofed, and she absolutely manufactured all of that evidence. So Pictures and screenshots are not enough to authenticate this. In many instances, if you want to challenge that, you can. All right, I will take a pause here now. Yeah, this is just incredible, Lars. I think everyone's just kind of like, you know, wow. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, some of this information kind of reminds me, and it's a little scary too, that, you know, that Netflix documentary, Social Dilemma? Yeah. I watched that and I was like, oh, I almost wanted to turn everything off. <laughs> But uh, so this is this is incredible. Now, um, we do still have a lot of great questions coming in. I do want to remind everybody <clears throat> that I will send you a copy of Lars's slides today. We are recording the webinar, so I'll make sure that you get a copy. I'll try to post it to YouTube later on um, this afternoon. But while I'm bringing in our final two sponsors, they're just going to take a couple minutes to share with you a little bit about what they do. Um, I want to ask another question, Lars. This one comes from Philip. He wants to know, um, I've looked at the cell phone tower data and it was obvious that it was inaccurate because the phone can pick up um, cell towers miles, you know, miles away from the location of the phone. So what mm -hmm. do you think about that? That can happen. Um, I have a whole team of sailor analysts. Uh, so I'm gonna talk as much as I know about that. Uh, when you're dealing with that, you have things that can absolutely make that happen. If you have a large body of water, other things like that, you can have that happen. Okay? Okay, mm -hmm. there is a way around this. Uh, we are one of the only private labs I have what's called as radio frequency verification. Okay, uh, this is also known as drive testing. The FBI and other law enforcement agencies do this regularly. The way this works is that, let's say you did have that issue. You're really concerned where it could be connected to. We have equipment where you actually have to drive around the area and you collect the radio frequency uh, strength from the cell towers and you create what's called a propagation map. So you can actually see where it would have connected to, okay? So what you would have there, if it really is really far away, is what's called a hotspot. We could actually verify that on a map, okay? Uh, that's the only way to do that is with radio frequency drive testing. Um, and that's, a, that's another class too. And that's very, very specialized. But yes, you, that is true. That can happen. And that's covered actually in one of our other experts book, uh, Cell Phone Location Evidence for Legal Professionals, which talks about that extensively. Okay, great. And I think that's similar to Jamie's question, because she had asked, um, is there a way perhaps through Bluetooth that two phones that were within a certain range of each other at a certain time, you know, can they kind of catch up, for example, like, do they get confused? Do they know which one it is? Um, that's an excellent question. That used to be an issue. I'm not sure if that's still that much of an issue now. And I don't want to answer out of turn. I don't know, but I'd be happy to answer that offline after a little, little research. Perfect. That sounds good. And if it's okay, we're going to close out of your PowerPoint just for a second. Um, we've got Leon Branham, who's with us with Fast Funds, an incredible guy. If you guys don't know him, definitely get to know him and give him a call um, because he's been in the industry like over 15 years. He knows everybody. Um, but particularly the work that he does is so wonderful and he can help get you the funds that you need for your cases and turn it around in like less than 24 hours, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit more about what you do and uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more. 
Sure, I'll just uh, do a quick uh, share screen and I'm just fascinated with today's topic. I've got kids with phones and um, I almost don't want to present and just listen to Lars uh, talk some more. But um, uh, for those who aren't familiar with Fast Funds, we're one of the first original litigation funding companies that started the industry nearly 25 years ago. And what we do is provide non-recourse funding for attorneys and plaintiffs on an individual case basis. It's no secret that it's like a financial David versus, versus Goliath in today's uh, legal landscape, where the plaintiff attorneys have to cover their own expenses on every case on a contingent basis. Meanwhile, the defense has all their fees and expenses covered by deep pocketed insurance companies, which creates a culture where the defense will delay the case resolution and will attempt to outspend the plaintiffs uh, as a tactic for your client to accept less than their case is worth. So what does a uh, plaintiff's attorney do uh, today? Well, they might try to self-fund uh, their cases, one case at a time. But after listening to today's uh, you know, speaker, what if they wanted to use Invista on more than one case? What if they had 10 cases? Are they able to fund 10 cases on their own uh, at once? And what about your other expenses in your office, like overhead and marketing? Some attorneys will look to partner with other attorneys, which is great, but if you don't cover your expenses, you're giving up another 40 to 75% of the fee that you would otherwise uh, be able to capture. Some attorneys will try to stretch their dollar with less expensive um, experts, but if you don't pay for the great experts, you won't get great results. Uh, some attorneys have, been, have tried to go to a bank uh, but banks are highly regulated and they don't give you value for your most important asset, which are your cases. Uh, so they're unable to you know, uh, help you out in funding your, your firm. And unfortunately, some attorneys um, have to live to fight another day and accept less uh, in, than the case is actually worth. Well, there's a better way. Uh, we've developed a unique funding product for plaintiff attorneys to help cover expenses on an individual cases on a non-recourse basis. That means there's no personal guarantee, there's no lien on your portfolio cases and or your attorney fees. If you don't recover in the case, we don't recover on the expenses that we funded on your behalf. Uh, that allows you to move more cases along by getting the right experts where they're needed most on more cases. Uh, and what that'll do is it'll increase your case value on more cases and also reduce the amount of time that it takes you to resolve. Uh, we've had uh, plenty of attorneys uh, through Connectionology and nationwide that have used our services. I'd be more than happy to give some references. I'll put my uh, contact information in the chat below um, afterwards and look forward to uh, the rest of the, uh, the webinar. Thanks, Ginger. No, thank you, Leon. And thank you for putting your information in the chat because I know we're going to have some people reaching out uh, wanting to know what's your phone number, what's your email. <laughs> so thank you so much. And thanks for being with us today. Um, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow as well for our special webinar. Can't wait. And now it is my pleasure. I'm really excited for you guys to meet Kyle Kenbringer, who is going to be, um, I think Ted Mollis is going to join us later because we've got the coffee giveaway that we're going to be doing later. Um, but anyway, for those of you who don't know Kyle, um, we've been working with him since day one. They do such amazing things over at HMR, and they also work with everybody all over the country. Um, great organization. Um, so Kyle, if if you could just tell us a little bit more about what HMR does and how you can help some of our attendees. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it's really been great for us because a lot of our, uh, you know, a lot of the attendees we've actually gotten a chance to work with at this point. So, um, so for those of you who don't know, um, primarily we get involved in cases where somebody's been injured uh, catastrophically, but they don't have. Uh, insurance or they're underinsured and can't get the medical treatment they need. So a lot of what we're getting these days is attorneys who are calling us who maybe practice in Los Angeles, but they've got a client they represent in Chicago and they need a brain injury treatment or a spine surgeon to assist their client in the, the medical needs they, they have. Uh, and we're able to uh, link everybody up. Um, and it's been great um, just because um, most of the cases tend to be complex. So we're getting these calls when uh, there's a lot of dollars on the line and a, a, a lot of people who are struggling with severe injuries. 
Um, all the funding we do is non-recourse. Uh, there's no interest. Um, we truly partner with the law firms that we work with. Um, we've got a tremendous back office staff um, because we've got reps all over the country. Um, we tend to try to get things moving within a couple of days uh, just because of the nature of, uh, of the cases being so complex. Um, we also do a little bit of pre-settlement funding because obviously a lot of these people end up being out of work. Um, and so we try to book in that with us getting them the medical treatment, but also helping them do things like pay bills and that kind of stuff as well. Um, if anybody needs any help out there, we'd love to be able to assist. Um, thank you so much for having us, Ginger. We really appreciate it. Uh, and if anybody's going to be at uh, Mark Lanier's conference coming up, uh, we're actually going to be doing another event at uh, the Grotto in downtown Houston on June 3rd. So we'd love to see everybody there if you can attend. So That is fantastic. Um, yeah, I highly encourage you guys, if you're going to be in it's Houston, right, it's definitely Houston. go by and say hi to Kyle. Um, he also is like the best connection because he's right there. He lives in New Orleans. <laughs> so if you ever come to yeah. Mardi Gras, and especially if you go to any of the races in Kentucky, I know he was just there recently. I'm coming next year, <laughs> hands right, down. Um, but anyway, we appreciate everything that you do. Not only do you guys have a great um, service, but you are one of the most genuine people I've ever met. So thank you so much for being here, supporting us and allowing us to do these webinars and these um, se live seminars later this year. That's so great. thanks, Kyle. Thanks for having us. And um, now I'm gonna go ahead and bring Lars back. He's gonna finish his presentation and then we're gonna get to all of your questions. They are so good. I, I can't wait to hear what the answers are gonna be. Um, so Lars, hand it right back to you. All right, we are getting close. So finish out a couple of case examples so we can see the, the detail part that I'm talking about and why digital evidence is, it really is granular in the details and that really matters in these cases. Now, this is a criminal case, okay? And this one right here, uh, we retained by the criminal defense lawyer in this one. Uh, we've done prosecution work too. Typically, the government has their own resources and experts. So, you know, that's why we're doing a lot of that. Uh, anyway, so in this case, this is a gang. And what they do is that uh, if you are elderly or infirm and you drive a really expensive car, they will come up to you at the gas pump, hit you on the head with a blackjack, hop in the car, drive it down to the, uh, the port. The, I'm not a nautical guy. I'm sorry. The pier and put it on a big vessel and ship it to China. And then they sell it to China for a lot of money. Okay. Uh, and they were doing this a lot, stealing a lot of cars. The defendant's like, I steal cars. I love to steal cars. I hit people on the head with a blackjack. It's my thing. I love doing it. No problem. The issue is, in this case, is that law enforcement found this picture of a gun on the phone and, want, and were claiming that the, he had a firearm at the commission felony. Okay. So they're saying he had a gun at the time so that they can up those charges. That's the objective, right? Well, what we want to look at here, my little pointer out, we see an Apple iPhone 4S is the phone, okay? Just remember that. So you got to remember, it's Apple iPhone 4S that took this picture. The defendant, it's my report, had two phones. They're both iPhone 4s, not iPhone 4Ss. That little detail they missed. I don't know how you missed that, but you missed this kind of detail. It's not the same phone, first of all. Either that or he's got another phone that they haven't recognized. And then also they didn't recover this chat thread, which we recovered. And this one, we see him talking uh, with Walta back and forth. And then Walta sends him pictures of these firearms. Now this case was out of Baltimore. Walta is in Africa, okay? That gun is in Africa. It's not in Baltimore. So it could not have been the defendant who did this. The chat said definitely shows that here, okay? So, and that's what this says here for the sake of, of, of time. Uh, it was not his firearm. He could not have had it. No firearm at, the, at that, no evidence of that. All right, one more. This is a, a uh, in this case is a, is a, um, it's a sex crimes case. Uh, we've done a lot of these. Obviously technology is highly involved in most of these types of cases. Uh, we've done to catch a predator case, which we actually, the, the, the attorney won on that one. Uh, we were able to, if you've heard of Perverted Justice, which is an organization that is paid to go out and find people to get on that show, uh, we ended up asking for their entire server of all their chats ever, and we're able to assist the attorney in showing that there was uh, inappropriate means to, to communicating to these people to get them to do this. And uh, this one it was a long for young young uh, young military guy who just 
didn't know better. Anyway, looking at this case, this is a firefighter. He's about uh, early 20s. He's talking to a girl. Uh, this girl is underage. She said she's of age in the application. Doesn't matter. Here's kind of the background of the story, okay? Mom finds her phone. Mom gets concerned. Mom calls the cops. Cops take the phone. Cops impersonate the girl in the chat threads trying to get a meetup. That's what they want to do. He does meet. He shows up uh, with movie tickets in the movie theater. Lucky for him, he didn't show up with condoms in a box of chocolates or something. So that was good in that regard. Good part of this case. Now, understand, that's where they started. They did not have what they needed to make a solicitation case. So they dropped that, and they instead charged him with uh, possession receipt of, of uh, child pornography, okay, from photos that she had sent him. Now, my only part in this case was a technological argument. And here's what it is. Did he intend to possess this? Is there evidence of him intending to possess and preserve this? Why does this matter? This matters because if I send you a message right now, you're going to get it. You can't not get it. If I send you an email, you're going to get it. It's going to exist on your device. It's going to exist in a particular place on your device and in a particular way. And that's what matters. Okay. But you can't not get it. It's coming to you unless you've blocked me previously, right? So those messages come in and here's how this works. You have a phone in this model of phone at this time, this is an older iPhone, but you're gonna have notifications on or off. You receive it, it's gonna look like this or that. It's gonna either be a message you receive, you're gonna see a tiny picture of it. Either way, it's on the file system of your phone in its entirety. What you would have to do to intend to preserve and possess this is to unlock your phone, hit the share or modify button, select the picture and save it to a photo album, okay? All of these messages in this case lived in the chat thread section of the phone. He didn't even know this was still there, uh, but this is where it would automatically go. It has nothing to do with a user doing anything to preserve it, okay? That was the extent of what I did in this case. This is from the law enforcement report. You see here, it's in the SMS section. So it's in the message thread, right? What this means is that there's no evidence whatsoever of attempting to try to hold on to that, to organize it, whatever else, to preserve it. It's just something you got. That, that's all they had at this point. Uh, he was looking at 25 years. They gave him a non, non-sexual endangerment of a child, no time, no registry. Uh, he got to keep his job as a firefighter. Uh, one final thing, when you're dealing with phones, okay, cloud backups in many ways are almost as good as having a phone. We can absolutely connect to the cloud and pull down uh, an iPhone backup, an Android backup, whatever. Okay, we can pull that down and view it like a phone. Second, if you back up a phone to iTunes or whatever else to back your phone up, that's just like having a phone. It's like having the phone. And sometimes it's better. It's better in this sense. Let's say uh, a year ago, they backed up the phone. You have the option to get the phone today and try to find evidence a year ago when it's the time you're interested in. Or we can go on the computer and get the backup that's contemporaneous to the time of whatever that incident is you want to examine or, or investigate, right? So sometimes that's better because you have a snapshot in time that can be older. Now, also remember these pods and players, your, your iPod touches that you give kids. These are literally iPhones without cellular service. You connect them to Wi-Fi, they can do everything, okay? We can do all those, your tablets, all that stuff too are the same thing. They're mobile devices, uh, even drones and whatever else. We can connect to that and pull the data. Data syncing is a real thing too, okay? Let's say they don't do backups normally, but if you have a Mac and you got an iPhone and an iPad, Apple wants to keep you in their ecosystem. That's how they make money. They want you to buy Apple everything. So your messages and everything sync between all your devices, okay? So for example, you have a case. There's an iPad, an iPhone, and a computer. Uh, the dog eats the iPhone, the aliens take the iPad, but we still got the computer, okay? Well, we examine the computer and it could absolutely contain all the messages that were on those other devices because they synced to the computer, okay? So there's other places to get this even if the primary source is not there anymore. I'll give you a quick case example on this and then we'll be finishing up. So I had a uh, employee in this case, it was an employment case. He was a high level employee at a bank. Uh, an email went out from a Gmail account that was his name at gmail.com. Uh, let's just call him John Doe at gmail.com. Okay, we send it out. And on this list were VIPs of very, very large financial institutions. You would know the name of if I said them. Okay, we, we all would, all right? So executives to multiple places. And in this e email he sent out uh, was pictures of his genitalia, okay? 
He says, I didn't do it. I was hacked. It wasn't me. It's not my email address. Okay. So he's got two phones and a computer or two phones and two computers. Uh, one computer was never, we never got. Uh, the other one had been partially deleted with anti-forensic tools and the phone had been wiped. It's gone, all gone, factory reset. Now the computer, interestingly enough, when you run anti-forensic tools, there's a few things that happen. One, if you try to use those, they create a huge mess, right? It's not like uh, they may get rid of the stuff you want to get rid of, but it's like a hurricane, right? It's like the digital hurricane, atomic bomb. You can see the debris everywhere in our world. We can absolutely tell that you've run these, okay? The second thing is, is it doesn't delete things he thinks you want to keep, okay? And the way this worked in this case is that he had iTunes to back up the phone, so he deleted iTunes, but that doesn't delete the backups. And that software is not going to delete what you haven't told it delete in this instance. He thought he was deleting it, but to actually get to the backups manually for an iPhone, you had to dig very deep into a computer file system. So we recovered the backups. And in those backups, I was able to see where he had uh, taken a series of pictures to get the best ones. And they're vertical. You see them sideways. You got them a thumbnail view. We got all the pictures you could want. I was able to recover where he had accidentally sent this message uh, to this work contact list. Uh, instead of his mistress. Uh, so I don't know the outcome of this case. I presented to their, uh, their, their board of directors and all that stuff just to give them the facts. So uh, either um, he's got a very interesting nickname or he doesn't work there anymore. Uh, but I do appreciate your time today. Uh, here's some of the books for our team of the Digital Forensics for Legal Professionals. The Digital Forensics Trial Graphics, I would not recommend. That's more for other peers in my, my discipline uh, to train them on how to do stuff. But Cell Phone Location for Legal Professionals, that's the only book like that on the topic. That's actually my father who wrote that one. That's an excellent book right there if you want to know about that particular topic. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lars. And um, so now we're going to get to some questions because I have a lot of great ones. And if we go over a little bit, it's not a problem at all. Um, so are you ready for this? Yep. All right, let's go. Um, first question comes from Nan. Um, what effect does a VPN have on phone forensics and collecting this type of data? Uh, to collect this type of data, we need the physical device, so none. Uh, the VPN would obscure your connection from one place to the other on the internet. Uh, so that goes through different servers, so you can't track back to a device, but that has no impact on this because we're pulling this directly from the phone. Okay, great. And then this one comes from Leonardo. He wants to know, does Google incognito option ha actually prevent you from finding searches through made through that function? So does Google incognito option actually prevent you from finding searches made through that function? So I'll talk about it as a whole private browsing, all of them. Uh, web browsers don't like to delete things about you. Uh, and we can absolutely recover private browsing, incognito browsing. Um, remember these work on that database type system like I was talking about earlier. A normal computer user, they're absolutely gone. If you're operating it normally uh, with forensic tools, it's highly likely we're gonna recover partial or all of that or a significant amount of that. Uh, caveats, it does depend on some other factors, but generally uh, highly recoverable. Okay, great. And then what about this one, um, whether surfing done in incognito mode can be tracked in any manner? Can be tracked in any manner. Um, I'm not sure surfing. what we're, we're asking. In, in yeah, the sense that um, our organizations and companies attempting to utilize your, your uh, internet browsing and the rest, yes. Uh, and absolutely law enforcement is running applications all the time that are tracking traffic. Uh, they're tracking things through National Sending Center for Missing Exploited Children and other places to, to track contraband files. Uh, they can track any type of file for the most part in a lot of different ways uh, using hash algorithms. So you can take a file and you can run an algorithm against it and get a unique number that uniquely identifies that file. Okay, and then you can search the whole internet for it and you can find it. You can search a computer to find duplicate documents. Uh, you can utilize that to see if traffic's going back and forth um, like peer-to-peer -peer file sharing to see if that is a identified child pornography image, for example. So um, without more specifics, uh, yes, there is tracking possible in a lot of ways. Okay, great. And then this message comes from Jason. Thank you so much. Um, is it correct to say that 
overwrite and factory reset are the only ways to delete data from a device? Uh, overwriting data with new data, yes, that is one of the only ways. Uh, a factory reset on a phone is highly effective. Uh, I would say that you're 99% sure to get rid of everything. And the only people who are going to get anything for something like that potentially are people like me who have these tools that can do it. Uh, normal people do not have these tools. They're very expensive, right? Uh, so not going to happen. Uh, the other way is to literally beat it to death. Just destroy it, okay? I know that's not fun. I got interviewed for the news once for one of the women's shelters on like how they should get rid of these phones and do all this stuff. And uh, they wanted us to take like 10 phones and use free tools on the internet to see what we could get back. And we got a ton of stuff back, right? Like huge amounts of data. So they, they cut this part out of the interview, but they asked what my suggestion was, if you really want to get rid of everything, like smash it to pieces. I mean, if it's that sensitive, you can't, you can't donate that one. Go buy another phone and donate that one out of the goodness of your heart. But if you got personal data on some of these uh, less sophisticated phones in particular, uh, don't donate it. <laughs> I know. I, and I think that happened to me once a couple years ago. I went to Brazil, spent five weeks out there, took the most amazing photos. I came back home, didn't think about backing it up because I just went straight to Verizon to get a new phone. The guy guaranteed me he could just transfer that information. Well, guess what? It was gone. I think yeah. he did the factory reset and I was never able to recoup those photos. So lesson learned, definitely save when you can and don't trust uh, every person that works there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next question is coming from Philip. Uh, do phone records show the 911 or the 1-800 calls? Uh, phone records will show those. Uh, you can also get uh, E911 e records. Um, I think we have language for that somewhere. Uh, my experts have, I have experts who have testified in cases related to the 911 call center. And E911 e e is the emergency 911 system that allows you to start tracking, real-time tracking. Uh, so if, if there's called in missing persons, there's concern about somewhere's at, if they're trying to find a fugitive, they can use it too. Uh, the cellular system by law has to, has to do this. That allows them to track real time. When you're talking about records, normally called detail records, you're looking at historical records, right? It's not real time. It's something that's happened in the past. You're getting that so you can see what happened. Uh, you can track it that way. But yes, those are recorded in, in the call detail records. If, they're, if the phone calls made, with a phone using the normal uh, phone calling method, right? If you did it through WhatsApp, it's not gonna be, right? If it's done via data, a data application or somebody calls from a computer, like we're, if we call from Skype right now, cause you, you're, or, you know, something like that, you put the phone number in, it would not. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then Mosey has a really great question. Um, she says, Lars, do you have any top suggestions for phone safety that you would like to share? And also thank you for this presentation. Phone safety. Um, it, as simple as it sounds, uh, just don't do things on your phone you don't want somebody to find. I mean, that's that's really what it is. Uh, the issue that we always run into is that something that's completely innocent, if you ever got charged with a crime or something happened, can look nefarious, right? That thing you randomly search for that you're interested in about chloroform or whatever, later on, if you get, it can look like evidence later when it's meaningless. So um, I don't know, I, use, I do all kinds of stuff with my phone. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not terribly concerned about it uh, with that, but a few, uh, a few things. One, I have my messages set to auto delete every 30 days. You can do that on your phone. Uh, you can, you can go and see your, your significant locations on your phone. You can delete those. I can send you a page on how to do that. You can go on your phone right now through your system settings, and it will show you all the places that you visit all the time uh, that it thinks are significant to you, both on Androids and Apples and just regular maintenance like that. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm probably not the best expert on phone safety for, for life. No Better at explo exploiting them to get the data out of them, so. And then um, Ted Mullis had a question who we're all gonna meet in just a few minutes because we're gonna announce the coffee giveaway. Yeah. But when we were talking about the factory reset button a couple minutes ago, um, does it truly wipe out what is on the phone? For example, if you were to sell a phone or you gave away an old phone, do, if you do the factory reset, does it truly wipe everything out? Yeah, so your, let's give an example. Your modern iPhones, you cannot do chip off like we talked about, where you crack, crack it open and pull the chip off, right? Because it's encrypted at a hardware level. If you factory reset an iPhone, it's, you can, you're safe. It's gone, okay? Androids, almost exactly as good. We could technically pull it out, pull the chip off and get some data or some other ways with those. 
it's going to be so tiny and you need very, very specialized tools. I would not be concerned doing that personally. Um, so yeah, factory reset is, is highly effective to get rid of the data on the phone. Okay, good. Good to know because I have, I have also sold a few phones before <laughs> or given them back to Verizon. Oh. Um, so this is a good question from Ken. Um, he wants to know, is there some way to retrieve Snapchat or WhatsApp information from some company, especially if the phone is no longer available? Uh, WhatsApp, we can recover from the phone. I don't recall off the top of my head with WhatsApp. Um, I could ask my team and they'd be able to tell me, and I can answer you. If you want to send me an email, I'll get you an answer to that. Snapchat, you used to be able to just a matter of months ago, recover Snapchats from a phone. Uh, with Snapchat now, they have changed it in such a way that it only resides on their servers and stuff. So like a phone, you're not getting anything for Snapchat. I have not seen any Snapchat data like subpoenaed or received from them. I have a feeling it's probably held for a certain amount of time then gone or that it's it's blocked from them even being able to access that so they don't have to respond to things like that. <laughs> you know, sometimes they do it that way. Uh, but I think you might be out of luck on those two instances. Um, but I, I'm not totally sure on WhatsApp, but I have to look, I have to look at that one again. Okay, thank you. And this is an interesting question from Steven. He said, if I turn off my phone and I'm driving in my car, can the phone still track my location? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So that's that's gone around like the thought that the government can do that. Uh, I can't confirm this. If the phone's off, it's not doing anything. Absolutely nothing. Uh, it's possible that there was a, an ability that the government could do to make your phone appear to be off, but it's not actually off, it's transmitting. That's, that's actually what was happening in that situation. Uh, if that did occur, which, which I cannot confirm nor deny about, about the phone tracking and the uh, government agencies who would be doing that type of thing, but that's how it would have to be done. If the phone's off, it's off. Yeah, so, okay, good to know. Yeah, because he said that prior question basically assumes that he had the phone in the car. So mm -hmm. very interesting. And um, here's a question from H. Lee. Um, does Invista analysis involve GPS service devices? Sure, um, I'll give you the quick list. We do computer forensics, cell phone forensics, location forensics, which includes GPS, geofencing, cellular location, device location. I have five experts, all they do is location forensics. So we do a lot of that. We do forensic video recovery. Um, we do in-vehicle infotainment and telematics. So that's the like car play systems and stuff. Uh, the, the value in that, for example, is we can see where your hands are at in a vehicle. Did you change the volume with the back of the steering wheel or did you reach across the car to turn a knob? Uh, do you see multiple people in the car because you, you see windows going up and down from the buttons in the back versus the buttons on the driver? Uh, we can pull that type of stuff. We take that information, give it to a human factor, give it to you to give to a human factors expert. We don't do human factors, but we can pull that type of data. It's different from the uh, event data recorder is, is the point. Okay, great. And then um, also just want to mention, so I'll be sending everybody a copy of Lars's slides, um, special handouts that he has. Um, a lot of people, Lars, have been asking for this letter of, of preservation. Sure. So did you want to send that to me as well and I'll just share it with everybody or do you want them yeah. to contact yeah. you directly? I'll send it to you and you can share it. That's fine. Okay. Sounds great. And then uh, we're going to take just a couple more questions. There's so many. I'm so sorry we won't be able to get to all oh, of them fine. today, but but this is good stuff. Um, Michael wants to know, are you familiar with a device called Stringway and whether these are routinely used by LEO and the Fourth Amendment challenges? Uh, I've, I'm extremely familiar with this. I've um, back at Duke University with the... Um, I can't even remember the huge group that does that. We've presented on that. I've got expert. I've actually, I've got two experts. One used to drive one of the trucks who works for me. So yes, we're, we're very familiar with Stingray and, and this applications uh, and the arguments and also being able to identify when Stingray is in a case because they won't say it's in a case. They never say it's in a case. They have all this fun language that you have to read through the lines that they use the Stingray to find someone. But, um, but no, I've employed two people who actually ran, ran units as a part of a state or secret service task forces that actually did track people utilizing uh, Stingray or the newer versions of Stingray technology. Very interesting. All right. And then um, I've got to ask this one from Clifford. Um, he wants to know, have you had any success pulling the historical cell site data past the two year cutoff mark, which I think T-Mobile and Sprint and a lot of them use? Yes. Uh, 
we keep track of the retention and keep updating that. We have that in some documents too. Um, just because they say it's two years doesn't mean it's always gone in two years. I know that sounds weird, but um, if it's a little past that, it's worth just sending out to see if you get any back. Send out a subpoena to see if you get any back. Because it's not, it's not like a hard, super hard cutoff, computer delete it, gone kind of thing automatically. It doesn't seem like. Um, but they're changing this all the time. They're, they're constantly changing how they do it and how they provide the data and, and their retention and everything else. But uh, I, I would definitely give it a shot. Okay. And then what are your thoughts on the geofence warrants in the future? Uh, we are working on a case related to that that I can't talk about right now. Um, and we have an article to go out as soon as that's finished because my expert, one of my experts is doing some the case the cases on that but i can't i can't talk about it right now um i i have a whole module on that we teach on the geofence warrants i'll tell you this because uh, this is you can when they do a g I'll, let me just ex explain it real quick from the technical side law enforcement can draw a circle on a map okay they can see any phone by doing a geofence warrant that is in that circle that they draw okay it can be a square or whatever in that shape that they draw so if they draw that circle around a house, but they also get a church or a hospital or a what school, you get all the phones, you get every phone, okay? That's in that area. Now, in order for them to get those phones, they have to query every single phone that has a Gmail location services, all of them, millions every single time okay every single time they do that they have to hit all the phones they then can get that information they can select who they want to look at that let that boundary is then gone for those people and they can see everywhere that person is gone so if if you're just chosen as a potential person of interest and you go out that morning and you get coffee with a friend and then you go see your your cancer doctor then you pick your kids up from school then you see your love interest then you go home or you hit the bar then you go home they have all that information right they've got all your activity uh even though um yeah that's i, I should probably stop that's there, there's a whole lot on that coming out i'll be happy to send it to this group when it does and like i said we have an article ready to hit send uh, to go out on that right now so okay like, great and then uh, one more question from Peter. So he wants to know, can all the data on a phone be destroyed simply by removing and destroying the chip? Uh, sort of, uh, you could try to do that, pull the chip out. There st will be data still on a SIM card if it has a SIM card. Uh, but if you, if you pull the chip out, you're probably, you're probably deleting all of it, yeah. Dest okay. If you destroy the chip. Okay, great, that's good to know. And then um, Jamie wants to know, do you have any experience with brute force password cracking tools for smartphones specifically? And do you use one? Yes, uh, we have multiple tools, many, many phones. We can crack the password in a matter of seconds. We have, we have a whole suite of tools we, we do with that. Uh, also with computers and encryption, we do that as well. Uh, we actually, when we typically do that, we have in-house processing capabilities when you brute force an attack. Here's what a brute force is real quick, just so we, we can get on the same page. If you have a computer, it's encrypted or it's got a password and you want to get past it, a brute force attack is where you point a tool at it that runs a giant dictionary, like massive combinations of words and numbers and all you can imagine as fast as it can. And it's hitting that password over and over and over again until it cracks it. Okay, that's how that works. So to do that well, you need a ton of processing power. So we actually usually buy processing power from Amazon or a cloud service so you can point a whole lot of power at it way more than anyone's going to be able to do other than a massive company like that. Um, and it just depends on the strength of the encryption, the type of the encryption or the password. If we're talking about a password. Some of these we can crack in no time because they're simple passwords. If they're more complex, it can be a month. It could be a few days. It could be a hundred years. It just depends on how complicated the password is and your, your, your processing power. Okay. But yes, we have, we have a whole suite of tools that do that. Fantastic. And then uh, we still have like a ton more questions. Um, and I'm so sorry, guys, that we can't get to every one of them, but I will make sure that I send the rest of your questions to Lars. And that way you guys can make sure that they get they all get answered. Because uh, this is incredible. This has been so interesting. I knew it was going to be as soon as I heard about it, Lars. 
Um, but what I'd like to do now is I'm going to bring in Ted Mollis real quick because we are going to do our special giveaway and we're going to find out who wins the coffee. But in the meantime, while he is logging in, I want to share my screen so that way you guys can reach out to Lars directly because I know that there's going to be a lot more questions. Um, this is just really fascinating stuff, Lars. And I, I've, I've got a question for you. How did you get into this? This is incredible. Uh, I, yeah. I looked at all your credentials and I'm like, wow, <laughs> I couldn't fit them on the, on the screen. But what brought you into all this? Is there any particular reason or you just didn't enjoy it? No, it was, uh, uh, I tried not to do technology for a long time, actually. My father is a serial entrepreneur and I worked for him in lots of different technology companies, including IT and fiber optics and all kinds of things that he did. And then um, ended up ended up back here and, and love the work. I think it's because it's the forensics and not the IT side. And most of what we know is is so specialized that it's useless in the real world outside of litigation and cases. So uh, mm -hmm. got a lot of training, got a lot of certifications, all the rest like that, and got into the field and just fell in love with it. So right. Family business, that's what it was. Well, you're definitely a good person to know. And um, I saw that one of our viewers is actually from Mumbai. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm amazed by how many people outside of the United States has been watching our webinars, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, do you also do some type of work with people who are outside of the United States as well? Yeah, we're a global company. Um, Invista okay. as a whole has about uh, 400 experts globally. Uh, my team, Digital Forensics, we have offices in Canada. I have an office in Canada and I have an office in London, uh, Toronto okay. and, and London. So we do work there um, in London handles all of EMEA more or less. Uh, so we have, and I have some, some other folks in Singapore and other places. Uh, so yes, we do work more than just in the United States. Okay, that's incredible. Um, so Ted, I see you are with us today. And um, you know, I just love how you're becoming a fixture within the industry, Ted, especially with this coffee giveaway. <laughs> so one of you is gonna win four bags of this freshly roasted coffee. And um, also what I love is not only is this such a special thing that we do here with Connectionology, but I see that it's getting uh, gaining momentum in other organizations as well that want this coffee. <laughs> so um, welcome. Thank you for joining us today, Ted. And uh, if you could do the honors, let us know um, who the winner is. Yeah, sure. Everybody loves coffee, so it's always a good thing. Uh, and our winner today is Robert Hayden from Riverview, Florida. And I realized that he won earlier this month too. So that's, congratulations, you're the Yay, first uh, congratulations. winner. Hey, that's wonderful to know because um, one of our past winners, um, Bob Hoyt out of, I think uh -huh. Atlanta, Georgia wrote me yesterday. He says, can I win again? He was like, I really love that coffee. And hey, it's all fair. Like, like I said, we do this the right way on Connectionology. Um, and we always, uh, Pick a few names. I, I look to see who the first person is on the list who's watching the webinar. And if that's you, well, you're the lucky winner. Yeah, yeah. So um, now if you didn't win today, don't worry. You got tomorrow, three o'clock. Be sure to jump on our 100th webinar. Um, we are going to have a lot of fun with Doug Beam, Catfish Abbott, and Richard Shapiro, who are great trial lawyers out of Florida. They are going to do the honors of presenting our 100th webinar, and we're going to have a lot of great prizes. I mean, Ted, you're going to be giving away $100 worth of coffee. Yep. Um, we've got Fast Funds who's giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. And On Point is giving away a special um, bakery gift card for those Danish Kringles, which will go along great with the coffee if you win that. Um, and then we might be actually giving away some registrations for our Santa Fe seminar, which is going to be September 19th to the 21st. So definitely want to tune in just to see if maybe you could be the winner of that as well. So um, again, I want to thank everybody so much for watching today. And then um, Lars, if you're still with us, thank you so much for taking the time to speak on such a valuable and important topic. Um, I feel like we could definitely go beyond this. Um, I know that you have some other great presentations, so we would love to have you back. Great. Thank you. And uh, for all those, if you email me today, please be a little patient. I'm out of town on work, but you can tell by my beautiful hotel curtain behind me. Uh, so I will definitely get back to you, but maybe on the plane ride um, on Friday if, if it's more involved. Okay. But I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. So, but thank you very much for having me. Well, we appreciate it. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Do you have any final comments before we say goodbye to everybody? Nope. Nope. Good to go. Thank you. All right. 
Well, you heard it. You guys have a wonderful day. We'll see you back again tomorrow at three o'clock. And thank you so much from the bottom of my heart um, for watching and supporting all of our webinars. Um, we hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you again later. Bye everybody. Yep.